Quite a few years ago, I had a student teacher who brought in a fish tank full of live crickets for her science unit. Unfortunately, she had to take a break from school for a couple of weeks, leaving behind her orchestra of crickets. Now, throughout her absence, the crickets chirped away, much to the delight of my first graders and less to the delight of me. A few years later, sound waves became a content area for first graders in science. Now, remembering the frequent chirping of the crickets, I decided to get some myself for my class. So I set them up with food to eat, cricket quencher to drink, and yes, that's a real thing, and places to hide. And then we waited and waited and waited. Somehow, I had sourced the most silent crickets in the greater Boston area. I tried putting them in the dark, I tried putting them in the heat, but nothing worked. And it was then that I realized I didn't know anything about crickets. My plan was to have my class observe and sketch chirping crickets, but what I didn't know is that crickets don't always chirp. So I thought to myself, how am I possibly going to teach this content when I really don't know that much about it? In fact, that's actually a question that a lot of elementary teachers have when it comes to teaching science. Uh, compared to the other subjects that they teach, most elementary teachers have a pretty limited science background. According to a 2012 survey, less than six out of 100 elementary teachers have a bachelor or master's degree in either science education or one of the sciences. And in the same study, almost two-thirds of them reported that they didn't feel very well prepared to teach science. Now, as you know, primary educators are required to teach all the academic subjects, plus social-emotional learning, community building, and more. And on top of that, there are new initiatives every year. And now teachers typically only get professional development when new material is introduced. Otherwise, they're often on their own to figure it out. That's why so many elementary teachers worry that they just don't have the time to get the background information at science that they feel they need. You know, recently I was reading a first grade teacher's blog and she wrote that teaching science was always challenging for her and she would even put it off to avoid students' questions. Now, uh, unfortunately, her perspective, it's not unique and it definitely highlights some real concerns. But it turns out that the key to teaching science is actually something pretty simple. Teachers just need to focus on teaching the difference between science content and science practices. Now, science content is information or science facts. An example is that adult male crickets sometimes chirp to attract females. Science practices, on the other hand, are things that scientists do. An example is the act of observing crickets chirp. Now, initially, I thought that I couldn't teach the science content because I didn't know it very well and that I couldn't tackle the crickets with my class. But then I realized that I could still teach the science practices even if I didn't know the content yet. So we decided to post our top questions in the classroom. Why do crickets chirp? How do crickets chirp? And when do crickets chirp? We talked about how this is what scientists do. They start with a question, make some observations, and watch what happens. This time, our crickets didn't chirp. What else could we try? You know, first grade classrooms are extremely busy places with lots of excited chatter and movement throughout the day. One morning when we'd had the crickets for roughly two weeks, we left the classroom for about an hour to attend a play. Upon our return, we were met at the doorway with the unbelievable sound of the crickets actually chirping. Now, I have to tell you, I've heard crickets chirp all my life and never felt the excitement that I did at that moment. <laughs> Instinctively, we all tiptoed back into the classroom. I motioned for the children to sit down with exaggerated mime-like gestures, and I crept over to the habitat to try to record the crickets chirping on my phone. But the moment I arrived, the crickets fell silent. So I tiptoed back, praising the children for doing such a good job, and then the crickets began again. Yet again, I went back, all ready to record. Crickets were silent. Students' hands flew into the air, full of conviction. The crickets are scared of us, the majority of them said. Another child added, I think the crickets are trying to blend in so we can't see them. <laughs> 
I continued to support the boys and girls as different ideas were mentioned. Now, we didn't know why the crickets chirped and then stopped chirping, but we knew for sure that our crickets could chirp. Now, this kind of science teaching can feel really messy, and we didn't get definitive answers to our questions that day. I'm sure some of the primary educators out there are thinking, this all sounds great, but you don't have the time to set up complicated setups for your class. As a first grade teacher myself, I would never suggest that you have to set up something very complex. In fact, the crickets and the conversations and exploration that I just told you about, all of that took roughly about 10 minutes. The rest of the time, they simply lived in the classroom while we worked on learning to read, mastering combinations of 10, and so forth. But by changing the focus to science practices, we had exciting opportunities to observe, question, and test in really meaningful ways for the children. So the shift you need to make is to focus on science practices as a way of acquiring that good science content. In short, you want to become a fab science teacher. Now, the F in fab means face your fears. Acknowledge and embrace that fear of not knowing all the content yet. I know I definitely felt panicked when I appreciated that I actually didn't know anything about cricket behavior. The A in fab means ask real questions. Model that science is about asking a question that you actually don't already know the answer to. Doing observations over time and then discovering new information using trusted resources. You know, at first we had some pretty straightforward questions, but once the children had a chance to observe and sketch the crickets, they had really specific ones. How do they cling on to the habitat without falling off? Do they have tongues? Do they sleep? And the B in fab means be okay with things going wrong. You know, a lot of the students' questions actually lead to more questions as opposed to easy answers. You know, for me, one of the biggest challenges has been when to investigate a question and when to turn to a trusted resource like a book or a website. Now, in the case of the crickets, there were some things that we could observe and some things we couldn't. It's really okay to do a mix of observation and research. The key is by changing your focus to the practices, you have that opportunity to acquire the knowledge yourself and let go of all of the pressure to already be a content expert. To begin, think of an area that you don't really feel you know in a lot of depth. Maybe you're a fourth grade teacher faced with teaching erosion or a second grade teacher who has to teach friction. Think of something you really don't know about it and take that leap and ask your question to your students. Give them a chance to ask their questions and then make a plan together to figure it out. You know, some of the things you'll be able to figure out from observations and some you can't. But the journey is one that's going to lead to authentic learning, both for your students and for yourself. You know, teaching science can be intimidating for a lot of elementary educators. When you're sitting in your classroom with 22 expectant faces looking to you for an answer, it can be very terrifying <laughs> when you don't actually have one. Just remember that the practices of science are the key to unlocking the content of science. This small shift in your thinking will make all the difference.